Welcome back to the Everyday Hair Colorist, episode eight. I have a really interesting guest with me today. Her name is Faye Smith. She comes out of the Birmingham area, and her salon name is House of Hair Hostess. Welcome, Faye. Well, hello, Jack. How are you? I'm great, thanks. I'm really thrilled to have you on here. So, I um, I met you quite a few years ago now, I think it is, and you were on a training course with me. Yes. Um, and September 2017. Sept- I remember it clearly. Oh, wow. Wow, you've got yeah. a good memory. I can't remember anything. But um, <laughs> you have this fantastic story, and I, I think that it's so commercial, and it speaks to so much of our audience. So at the moment, I, I'm loving your gram and what you're doing, but you rebranded yourself because you'd had a business before. What, what happened there? So I had a salon in... Oh, gosh, back in the 90s. So I opened in November of 94 uh, and I had that salon for 10 years. It was a fantastic business, but I just never really felt right about it. So I closed it down and went and rented chairs. Okay. That's plural. So I I love the fact that it was plural. You were so busy you needed more than one chair. Well, no, it wasn't that story. What What I mean was that I moved from salon to salon. Oh, because I never felt quite right. I never felt comfortable where I was. It was just something niggly. But I thought it's easy. You know how it goes. It pays the mortgage, pays the bills, all that jazz. You know, you can go on holiday. But there was still something niggly at the back of my mind. There is a draw to being an independent. But then you took the plunge to open another salon. Yes. That must have been... What Actually, what was that like? Was that scary for you? Was that... The actual opening of the salon wasn't scary for me at all. Right. I, again, I, I tend to thrive with things like this. I like to get my teeth into things. The scariest part for me, Jack, was the journey getting to this salon. Because to be quite honest with you, once I closed the first salon, I vowed anybody that knows me and that really knows Faye would say, Faye said she'd never open a salon ever again. Right. I always said I would stay Renting a chair or being employed, it it didn't really matter. However, I had such an emotional journey, Jack. I worked in several places. You know, they were great places, but sometimes things don't go quite how you feel they should be going. And I just felt unsettled in certain places. And it was such an emotional time. Very soul searching. Quite yes. Well, I think a lot of us yeah. do. I mean, I certainly felt very low at one point when I was yeah. sort of trying to find where Jack Howard fitted in salon life. It, it's a tough one, really. If, you, if you've got personality and ambition, it can be crushed by people or, or right. disliked by there them. There you go. Yeah. yeah, there you go. There you go. So with all of that, Things happened in and around me that I didn't like. And I just found myself shrinking into, into like a shell. But yeah, I knew that this was not Faye, this was not me. And it came down to a client, a regular client of mine, her name's Val. She'll know who she is. And she said to me, what is wrong with you? And I said, nothing. I said, you're not going to fool, you're not fool, you're fooling me back. She said, there's something wrong. And I thought, you know what? She spotted it. I've got to get out. I've got to get out and I've got to do what I've got to go and do. Yes. But I need to know what this thing is. That's when I began to start searching. And it was actually the bridal company that got me off the salon floor and into another salon. So I opened up, I opened this bridal brand. And then whilst growing that business, I was then able to save quite, quite a bit of money and be able to open this salon but that whole journey was quite an emotional one because there were lots of different things that happened along the way. Yes. That could have quite easily stopped me from being where I am today. But actually, Jack, they made me even stronger. It's funny, isn't it? Because I look back on those sort of experiences for me and that those moments when I felt defeated in a second or, um, you know, not downtrodden because I think lots of people would look at us and, and not think those things about us. But, you know, I ate a lot and I drank too much and I was really unhappy. Um, but then when I look back at it, it was those things that actually pushed me to where I am now. And so, you know, yeah. so for whoever was an absolute asshole to me, I'm actually quite thankful. Uh, that's exactly what I, I speak this story on my salon floor 
weekly. I, you know, I'll have a client come in and she'll say, oh, how did you get here? And I always thank the people that were nasty to me, that made me feel like as if I was in a corner. I mean, the times when I drove to work, I'd have to stop at the roadside to catch my breath because the anxiety was coming down. And anybody that knew me would never have guessed that right. or thought that they knew me. But I kept going, Jack. I just kept going and I kept my head off and I just kept striving and kept striving. So the people that did what they did, I thank them for it yeah. weekly. And because it, without that, I wouldn't be here today. But it's also quite a blessing, isn't it? Because I think that yeah. once you get past that being angry at them and you can thank them, all that power is gone anyway. Yeah. But So your bridal business, you, you still do that, don't you? Because I see you, you do a lot of bride stuff on your I story. Do. So is that po- Have do. you merged those two together? No. So Hair House Face Bride was the actual first main brand. Right. So the house came from Hair Hostess Bride. So I wanted to have House of Hair Hostess. Originally, this is going back to the beginning when we first started this uh, conversation, Jack. The salon was set up originally, and the way it's styled at the back with the bridal area with the draped curtains was really set up to look after my brides and the bridal parties in this salon. Right. That's what it was originally set And I just happened to be a hairdresser. Do you believe me? Right. So I waited seriously. So I came in with it being a bridal salon, yes, and I was a hairdresser as well. But that's when I switched. That's a, that's a great story because I think that there are many of us in the industry who have gone through times where we know that we can pay the bills and the mortgage yes. and have the vacations and that that is enough and it's good enough. But there are, there, in the back of our minds there is that we, we know that we can do more, we can be better, but it's taking yeah. the risk, isn't it? Yes. So you took the risk again and you opened the doors. I did indeed, Jack. Little did I know that the business that I started three years ago wasn't going to be the business that catapulted me to where I am today. So I've sort of seen bits of this on your stories and everything. Yes. So you open the doors and you kind of think, well, I've been successful in doing this. This is it. It's mine now. Um, but you've talked a lot about USP. And as we know, in this, this day and age, it is great to have a, a USP to get to known for something. How did, you get yeah. to the, how did you get to finding your USP? It was consistently having people coming into the salon and asking for a specific thing. And I think I'd have been a fool to ignore it. I constantly had people coming in and ask, they were asking us to clean up. Can you clean this up? Can you sort this out? And I thought, hang on a minute. There's something in this. Yes. Let me just concentrate on that specific thing. And that's what we did. So I've, you see it on your stories. You, you have some of the messiest heads of hair come into a salon that, make, <laughs> that some people would just shrink away from and die yeah. and cry. Yeah. And those are the ones that I rub my hands together and I lick my lips and I get that knife and fork out and I'm ready to go. I love it. The messier, the better. The messier, the better. Well, the results Absolutely. are always so beautiful. So talk, talk me through how you decided to turn that into your brand. Okay, so I went to your course for us actually in the September of 2017. And the following February, I went uh, back to London and I did a course with um, Ryan Whedon, the Masters of Balayage. And I was sitting in the audience there listening to the uh, demonstration that was going on. And somebody happened to mention and say, well, what if the person's got box dye? And I kind of looked across the room and thought, OK. And everybody said, don't touch it. So I sat there and I thought, why wouldn't you want to touch it? So literally on the train coming back from London, back to Birmingham, I decided, right, when I get back to that salon, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take what nobody else wants. I think that's really clever. Well, first of all, what I always teach in a classroom is that rules of colour don't change just because it's a balayage application. There you go. But everybody seems to think that if somebody comes in with a box dye and they want a balayage, if they can't get it in the balayage application, somehow they failed. But the true 
piece of it is, is that you should first of all correct the box dye, get the hair into the way you want it to be, which needs to be charged for, yeah. and then do the balayage. Yeah. And exactly. you've, take, you've taken that and turned that into your, your business. Yes, that is what, that's the kind of work we get day in, day out, consistently throughout the week, constantly. I'm not saying that every single client comes in has a box dye. No. But I'm able to, you know, project the fact that if you do have a box dye, don't think that we can't fix it because we can, whereas most stylists will turn box dyes away. Yes, I think, I think people get frightened, don't they? Yes. So the team, how did you train the team up to get ready uh, for that? Because there must have been a lot of top lips sweating. Well, I'm very... I came back to my salon with that idea and nothing was going to waver me. It didn't matter what anybody would say. I, I just knew what I was doing with it. So the team that I had at that time, yeah, because you know how salon life can go, they were very, very on board with it. I'm happy to embrace it, but they just weren't sure how we were going to do it. I said, don't worry about how we're going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to train you how to do the work. Right. I'll, I'll turn the business around. That's what, that's what happened. So, do you know what, Jack? Your videos. <laughs> the day I met you in the September, I had you on my phone <laughs> and I videoed you. I don't know if you remember. I bet I can go into my Google and find some of the video, actually. And I showed it to the team and said, this is what we're going to do. And I remember you saying to me, this is where you load it. This is what you do. And I kept saying this mantra. Yes. kept saying this mantra and kept telling them, this is what you do. And then from that, we kind of developed our own kind of fashion of what we would do in salon to make it work for box dye. That's what we did. Yeah, so you have, um, you, you said to me, I think it was really interesting, we were in an event together, and you said that you were the salon that people came to when they felt there was no hope. Exactly, Yes. You've become the salon to go to when there seems no hope left. So these, these clients have tried every hairdresser in town. They've not been happy. We all know that a client like that, but it's not the kind of clients I encourage to come to me because it makes me nervous. Um, and it's, right. and it's, fra- it's a fraught process. It's not that technically you can't do it, but it's fraught. And you're actually, you've made something from it. How do you help your team manage that and how do you manage the people that come to your chair because you become like the savior of chaos yes. in hair in your area yes we are almost like the superheroes yes <laughs> so team wise i i feel that i really instill in my team that you can do this you can fix it if my team know that i am super confident i feel that they draw down from that yeah they then become confident as well when the person at the top isn't confident they're going to be even less confident than you so that's the first thing for me is that i pass my own confidence onto my team right secondly the knowledge that i have everything that i learn i bring back to the salon i encourage my team to educate themselves as well i send them on education as well so i feel that we have the tools to you know do the work that we need to do that comes to the door on a daily basis right in terms of clients i would say we all do consultations don't we or we all should do, we all should do consultations we should all do consultations and yeah. i am finding as you know i'm on the road a lot i am finding more yes. and more people are raising their hands saying yes they do whereas there was yes. one point when people weren't at all i go way back to i don't know 30 odd years in the industry i don't think i've ever worked in a salon where stylists don't do consultation me personally right um, but I, I am aware that some salons don't do consultations. How they get through a day, I don't know, let alone a week, a month, a year, I don't know. Exactly. I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Even my regular clients that come in for a shampoo and blow dry, I will still sit them down because, oh, yes, I do, because it's personable. And I never want my regular clients to feel that they're not special to me, like the big balayages or the big colour corrections that come in. Yeah, I, so every client to me is special. Well, they should be as well because, yeah, yeah I agree with you on that. Well, often they get whisked in the door, don't they, to the backwash. I'm like, no, hold on a minute. Let me speak to Mrs. Jones or whatever and just see what's happening this week with her hair. But in terms of the clients, 
getting, um, we sit them down, we discuss with them their, their vision of their journey, and then I will then listen to the key words and key factors that they give me. People give a lot away, I feel, in body language, how they sit, how they speak, what images they bring with them, um, you know, what they expect. So once we've discussed all this with the client, and I try and put together a programme as best as I can for that client. And once I have that programme, I then make sure that the client, before she leaves, understands the journey. That's good. I think the journey is the most imp- one of the most important pieces in yeah. any sort of consultation and creative process these days in a commercial setting because, yeah. of course, not everything can be finished in a 45-minute appointment. Not at all. Are you booking out bigger periods of time or are you still doing it sort of 45 minute an hour? And how then do you price it and talk about cost? So we are definitely booking out bigger slots for clients. And we, as part of their consultation, we express to our clients how long this particular service today, how long it could possibly take. Yeah. So we don't, I will tell my clients, if you have the school run, you know, kids to get at three, get somebody else to do the childcare because I can't guarantee that you could be out on time because I don't know what I'm going to pick up along the way in the journey when I start to lift the colour out and things like that and try and correct. So I always try and make sure that people realise that these things do take time. Yeah. And are people receptive to that? Yeah, most of, most clients um, say to me, "You're so super honest today. I'm glad that you're you know you're to the point. I know where I stand, X Y Z." And they often use it as a bit of a day where they can chill, relax, or sometimes they work from the salon on you know laptops and things. And yeah, it's it's a really really great time. It's brilliant, and yeah. it's, so it's nothing to be afraid of. Is basically what yeah. you're saying because you've pre-planned yeah. it all. Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. That's really nice. So I had noticed that, um, you know, we talk about this whole uh, deposit thing going on and you and I have both ranted in direct messages about people not turning up and and all of that thing. But you've taken it a step further, haven't you? You've actually taken deposits for all bookings in December. Yes. Oh, well spotted. Mm. Yes, I have. So I'll give you a bit of background on that, Jack. So we recently had a new system in Salon and um, with the changeover of the system, I had to collect some data. When I went over the data, I was shocked. And I found that in 2017, I'm going to say the figures, we had four and a half K worth of um, lost business. So people not showing up or cancelling at the last minute, X, Y, Z. And I thought, no. And in 2018, that actually went up. Jeez. So I said in 2019, that's not catching me. That's not happening. So I made sure that I checked what was going on and I realised that it was no shows, deposits, you know, people not um, turning up for consultations. That's when I introduced the deposit situation first. And then I looked at December, our peak period. Yeah. And I thought, no, that's not going to happen. That's when I introduced the December deposit. And across the board, it's gone down super well. I often find if somebody complains, they're more than likely not to turn up anyway or to cancel at the last minute. Yeah. It proves the point. So are you taking the full price of the service for December? No, we stick to one standard fee. It's a £25 deposit. Right. And you found that that just... Because I, I found the deposit fee for the console, it didn't, yeah. it didn't matter whether it was a penny or £100. People turned up because they'd spent, spent that money. Absolutely. And so you finding that that just be, works for yourself. Because what I've been yeah. thinking about, Faye, is I've been thinking about if somebody doesn't turn up for an appointment to actually charge them for the full appointment, which is pretty risky, isn't it? I'm teetering on that. Yeah. I'm teetering on that because I just feel as if, if, if it were another profession like a dentist, yes. people wouldn't dare not turn up or they'd ring up and cancel at least. Yeah. So why is it that us as hairdressers, why do we get 
these kind of treatments. It's bizarre, isn't it, really? When you think about yeah. what we put into our into our careers and into our businesses. I mean, I'm not, I, you know, my business is me, but I see, yeah. I see what Paul Edmonds, they, what they spend on making sure that the environment's beautiful and the training of the oh, staff crikey. and, yeah. you know, maternity leave and all of those things. And just the skill sets that you need in this tw- the yeah. 21st century for us n- to say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. And then the staff member goes doesn't get paid but gets paid by the hour still but they just go and sit around wasting their time and and actually it's quite depressing when you're not busy in our industry so yeah i had um what was it i went on and i've been doing a lot of uh, like mentoring type um courses recently and the lady said there the staff room is the room of the low earners yes yeah (laughs) laughed about that I'm going to be honest, I don't have a team like that. Right. Nice. Okay. They they don't tend to go in the back and hover around the tent. If somebody doesn't doesn't show, one, they'll chase the client up. They'll phone they'll phone the client. Right. And two, they'll find something out from the salon. There's always something to do, isn't there, in a busy, busy salon. And then we get straight onto Instagram and we sell the space anyway, immediately. So I think that, you know, team members should be... Uh, if they're not actually doing a client, they should be maybe filming somebody doing a client, creating content, um, sweeping up, washing dishes, folding towels, helping out. You know, yeah. everyone's entitled to a break. I totally get that. But the, Absolutely. But the idea that somebody's going to sit in, they obviously don't care if they're sat in there all day waiting anyway. So, yeah. So talk to me. Talk to me a little bit more. So we're, we're staying on the gram. We're staying on what your business is. So. Yeah. How did you feel, were you nervous about putting up your corrective journey and talking about what you did? Did you feel threat that you might be threatened by that and lose business to other people? Or did you feel super confident showcasing actually what you did? No, I can't honestly say to you what I felt. Uh, there, there wasn't any fear in that, but on the other hand, there must have been some kind of fear because I tend to thrive on fear okay that's how i tend to up level as such so i feel jack that what happened for me is the fact that i was standing in this salon in the first year and business business was good because i brought a clientele with me but i knew i had to do something else to earn more money and get new business new business into the salon yeah because i was running on my core clientele and if I wanted to grow my business and start taking on more stylists, I had to get them business. But I had to think about what kind of business do I want through my door? Do I want the same business as I'm what I'm already doing? So you're going to keep getting what you've already got. Or do I want something new? And I wanted something new. I was hungry for it. I love your stories. I sometimes I look at them and I'm like, oh, my God. The first picture is like, this is what came in today. And I'm like... Oh my god! And then it's like, and then it's like an arrow and a diagram of all the different bands that are in there. Yeah. And then it's yeah. like, and then so we did this, this, and this, and this, and then I did this. Yeah. And this is the end result. And I'm like, how the hell did that happen? Um, yeah. And like, you know, really pleased for you because it's great work. It's great results. Have you absolutely? Have you noticed uh, product companies interested in you now because of? the work that you're doing. I have indeed, Jack. So I have been gifted a few brands. Um, I'm going to be honest, away from, I would honestly say, nothing to do with colour, and that is a smoothing service. I haven't had anything arrive to me that I've been that overly overwhelmed with. Because we are a bleach and glaze, you know, lightning and, you know, glaze uh, salon, my lighteners have to be super amazing. Yes. And I've tried a lot of lighteners and I've been sent a quite a few lighteners and they just haven't hit the mark. There's one in particular that I really love. Um, but yeah, I've had so many send things to me and that's great. Keep sending them. Well, it's not only that, it's not just so much them, them sending stuff to you. It's the fact that you're on their radar because they're, you're, yeah. it's what you're doing. And it, so it's changed, hasn't it? So it used to be that if you were a big account, product companies would give you work or ask you to do something. Whereas yeah. now product companies are looking for people and companies who are great 
on IG and who are doing great stories because they want to collaborate with them. And it doesn't yes. matter where you are or where you're based. Yes. yes, that is so true. And as I say, at the moment, the biggest company that I have is, is, is a smoothing brand uh, and there's something happening in the future with them as well. Brilliant. That's uh, great super stuff. exciting, yeah. And that's from your, all your hard work. So d- yeah. does anyone do your Instagram or do you do it all yourself? I absolutely do it all myself, Jack. I would never, ever allow anybody to run my Instagram because you can't speak for me. You'll never be able to speak how I speak. Exactly. There's no authenticity in it if somebody else does it, is there? No. But the big concern that's going on, and we've sort of had these ongoing conversations that we hear, and, and especially, you know, you and I both go to events where they talk about social media. Yes. Um, it, it's like the time. Where do you find the time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want me to really tell you? I can be Instagramming while I'm cleaning my teeth, while I'm on the loo. This is no word of a lie. I, it, it, when I'm in bed, any minute or second that I have, that's when I Instagram. Yeah, I feel Literally. pretty... Literally. I'm like you on that. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you have a plan for your stories for the week or are you going with the flow and it just how you feel? I'm a very off-the-cuff person. I'm yeah. a very... It's, it's what I feel at that time. I'm not one that schedules things... Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I do it as it comes into my sort of mindset and think, do you know what? Somebody mentioned that today in someone. Let me do that. Let me run that story today. That's how I tend to work. And then so are you, you're just building content and then going back to it when you want it, when you feel you need it? Or are you just... On occasion, yeah, yeah. I, I generally, you know, do you, the story will generally be what happened in salon today. But... On occasion, I'll go back to something, I'll pocket something and store it and think, I'm going to go back to that. Yes. So I store a little bit now, uh, yeah. much more than I used to. And I figured out that it only took me God, half a lifetime to figure out that if I favorite, favorited a picture, I could access it easier than scrolling yeah. through my whole screen. All yeah. those kind of silly little things that you pick up on it. And I, I do like to store some of it. But I actually, usually, if I've taken a good, couple of good pics, I quite like to use them straight away because fe- I'm yeah. feeling it of the moment. Mm. Do you think salons need other people to do this for them? Or do you think that you just get up and get on with it? I mean, personally, I feel that you should just get up and get on with it. But I have one salon. I suspect if you, if you have a lot of salons then and you still want to keep control of them all i don't think that's physically possible no i don't yeah but where i am at the moment this is what suits me at the moment what might might happen in the future i don't i don't actually know are you training the team to take pictures as you like them or are you encouraging them to make oh, content yeah. we have power hours no like, we don't have staff meetings we have a power hour so i try not to be negative in any way when we have these kind of meetups so a few power hours ago, one of them was about teaching them how to take the best picture that they possibly can. Right. I try not to make them get too stressed about it in terms of time and things like that. I just ask them to get as many pics as they can, and surely from one of them I can use something. Well, you hope so, don't you? Well, no, honestly. I, I mean, when you see the, the images, we get so much. But some of the staff get stressed about it and think they have to take the perfect picture. I, right. I don't. I try not to pressurise them like that personally. So I'm looking at your account at the moment right now. So it's right in front of me and I'm just having a, <laughs> a whiz through again. And uh, it's, it's quite eclectic, isn't it? That's it, me? Yeah, I like it. And it's mm. not that we haven't got tons of backs of the heads. Nope. Which is nice. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. You've got all sorts of different things going on in there. So that keeps it really interesting. Where's yeah. your your target audience is your area. Yeah. And so what are, you, what are your favourite hashtags for that? Uh, that that'll, be, that'll be local. I tend to, do you know what? I tend to hashtag things like the local coffee shop, places that women will go to. I do, actually, I do a lot of women in the business. Um, I do a lot of networking. Right. I, like to, I like to pick up clients from, you know, that work within business as well because people just assume that these women don't have uh, hair problems, but often they do. Mm-hmm. And so I tend to 
hashtag all the local places that I think the local women would go to. Uh, the gym and things like that, my local gym. Uh, there's a local restaurant down the road that's just opened up, Plat <coughs> Platform 3. Um, I get a lot of clients from there. So just all the local small small businesses, really. Brilliant. Yeah, I just wanted to add as well, Jack, that um, whilst talking about local hashtags, I just remembered something. Two winters ago, we had a really bad weather in the Midlands with that crazy snow that came from like nowhere. And do you know what, Jack? We had one of the worst fortnights ever. And I stood in this salon and I thought to myself, what am I going to do if this happens again? And this could happen again where we have really, really bad, bad winters. Mm. And what I noticed was that clients were ringing my salon that were local and they were saying, are you open? And I said, Yes, we're open. That made me realise that if I actually focus on local business, this is going to sound really bad, but in bad weather, people will still come. Of I haven't got to have people travel from out of my local area to get to me in bad weather. And that's what happens here. This is, this is funny because when I worked in the States, my, uh, you know, horrendous snowstorms and things like that. Yes. And my boss there, his name was Terry Bell, said to me, he said, if the gay bars are closed, we are closed. But of course, the gay bars were never closed. So it didn't matter what yeah. the weather was like, you'd go in. And because everyone yeah. else had been sent home or couldn't get into work, you actually had good days in bad weather. Yeah. You know, financially. So that's really funny. That's what we had. And yeah. it's savvy. It's really savvy. Yes. Clever you. I'm always looking for something, Jack. You know me. Well, I think we all are, aren't we, really? I think one yeah. of the things about the, these podcasts are about sharing things that have worked for us. Um, and it's not about being necessarily Instagram famous. It's about using platforms to make your business successful. Um, oh. And I, I think one of the fundamental things is really that you need to be talking to your audience and yes. that means you need to know what your audience, who your audience is and where your audience are. Absolutely, 100%. How do you think your gram has grown? How do you think, when you look back at some of your first stuff going on to where you are now, what, what do you think your strengths are? I feel, I feel like my Instagram, in the beginning it was clients and possibly friends that, kind of followed and watched. What I've noticed more so in the last sort of six to nine months, I'm um, getting a lot of notice, as you've mentioned before, from other salons yeah. in around the Midlands and out further as well. But the strength for me definitely lie in te you know, telling a story. Yes. I'm going to be honest, I'm not a huge grid person. If I do a story, I'll get bookings from it. If I do a grid post, very rare that I get a booking. Your stories are so strong, though, and that is what all, has pulled me into you. That's what drew me yeah. into you because I, they make me go, and I've said it already, they, they do make me go, wow. You, your your yeah. stories are superb. And, of course, that Thank you. that is the place where people are going because it seems the grid's quite static, isn't it, unless you, you yeah. do video. And I think it's also... If we've got a clientele of different age groups and everything, we, not everyone's got 19-year-old hotties in there. But 19-year-old <laughs> hotties don't come to the salon a lot anyway. Actually, it's your no. 30, 40, 50, 60 type of age group, go. which is what brings in the money. So there needs to be a way in which to tell that story yeah. to them as well, as well as having nice hair on, on, the, on the grid as well. Yeah. And I might just add as well, Jack, and we get a lot of business as well through Facebook. I know a lot of people don't talk about Facebook a lot, but we do get a lot of business from Facebook as well. But I have noticed a different demographic, a different type of client. So that, that's really cool and interesting because we've been talking about Facebook a little bit. Um, and, you know, I have a Facebook uh business account obviously because I wanted my Instagram account to be business and it doesn't yes. draw any clients in for me my clients all come in from my Instagram page but it I know that outside of London in different regions people do really well on Facebook yes. it you know it's a it's yes. a community isn't it the way I kind of teach my my team to try and understand the different platforms is so our Instagram 
is obviously it's instant and it's visual and it's quite kind of, you know, interactive really with like the messaging boxes and you can guess this or you can have a poll and stuff like that. However, with your Facebook, I feel that the feed that we have on our Facebook, you will tend to attract a different type of client that wants to speak directly to the person through the message box, but they're not that busy or bothered about being totally engaged with the page all the time. Right. Do you understand what I mean? So yes. it depends on the type of client that you want to attract or the type of clients that you do tend to attract. And we do have a mixed bag of clients, really. Well, I think a mixed bag makes it quite interesting anyway, doesn't yeah. it? The same thing all day yeah. long would be get a little bit boring. Yeah. So, who are... Um, I'm going to put you on the oh. spot a little bit. Oh. It's okay, though. Don't worry. <laughs> We're going to talk about people you like to follow on Instagram. Have you got a couple of people you like to follow that you give a shout-out to? I have. I have. I have. I have. I have Jamie Dana, who I am, like, obsessed with Jamie Dana. Right. She's over in the state. He came onto my radar, I'd probably say, about a year ago. And do you know what? It was actually the visuals at first. But then I started looking at her stories and following her. I'm thinking, girl, he's, like, incredible. So she just works out of what they call the booth. Uh, she now has given up working in the booth and now travels around doing, you know, talks and seminars and things like that. The other person is a lady over in Ireland called Katrina. 